When you think about zombie games, you're probably thinking of games with shambling corpses that you don't have much to defend yourself from, or games where you aren't locked in there with the zombies. They're locked in there with you! But what if the game does something slightly different? What if the game throws you in the middle and tells you to go nuts, have fun? That is what the game Dead Rising is. A game that is as close to open world as it can be, while telling you you can do pretty much whatever you want encouraging you to have fun with zombie killing with anything you can get your hands on. If you're looking for a good time, a story that doesn't take itself too seriously, characters that you love or you hate, look at it, you, Kent. And a game that boasts up to 800 zombies on screen at a time, that last part isn't true, but roll with it, then Dead Rising is your guy. This game is quirky, deeply involved, and sometimes erotic? But overall, it's just fantastic. So let's take a deeper look into what makes it so great. If there's one thing we can agree on, it's that in the late 2000s, the video game world had a loving relationship with zombies. Games and movies featuring zombies were everywhere. We've got your Dead Spaces, Angry Faces, Left 4 Deads, Typing Dreads, Residents, Dead Presidents, and everything in between. But at the beginning of the seventh generation console war between Xbox 360, PS3, and the Wii, Zombies hadn't hit their mainstream popularity yet, and with the biggest zombie franchise, Capcom's Resident Evil, dropping absolute gold with Resident Evil 4 in 2005, things were sure to head in that direction, but Dead Rising didn't exactly pan out that way. In 2005, Capcom released a game known as Shadow of Rome, an action-adventure game that revolved around the assassination of Julius Caesar to appeal to a more Western audience. Meant to be a series of games, Shadow of Rome bombed on release, and with the sequel already in early development, executive producer Keiji Inafune, known to most as the father of Mega Man, needed to pivot. Capcom Corporate obviously wanted a game centered around zombies in the same vein as Capcom darling franchise Resident Evil, but Inafune had other plans, choosing to show zombies in a more comical way, and how the everyman would deal in that situation. Influenced by George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead so heavily that not only did they put a disclaimer on the box of the game, but also had the copyright holders of the movie try to sue them, Dead Rising puts you in the middle of a zombie outbreak in the middle of a mall and tells you good luck. Showcased at a few game trade shows over time and slated as an Xbox 360 exclusive, Dead Rising developed its role of film for the world to see on August 8, 2006. While most games give you a general feel for what you're getting into as soon as you start, Dead Rising sets a tone from the beginning that only half encapsulates everything that it has to offer. It's a game that doesn't take itself too seriously and has some B-movie cheese that only Capcom can muster. Set in 2006, the city of Willamette, Colorado has been experiencing some unknown chaotic event. Tipped off by his source, photojournalist Frank West arrives via helicopter with the help of the pilot Ed DeLuca and witnesses some of the chaos firsthand through the lens of his camera, even finding out that the military has blocked off all roads. They're soon chased by some military choppers and Frank requests to be dropped off on top of the Willamette Parkview Mall, telling Ed to come back for him in three days. <laughs> Once at the mall, Frank notices this guy being weird, and when he notes that whatever's going on sure isn't normal, this guy makes it like 10 times weirder. Doesn't sound like civil disobedience. It's too quiet. <laughs> Almost as if everyone's already dead. Yeah. So why don't you just tell me already? What's going on? I think you'd better see for yourself. This, my friend, is hell. After getting inside the mall and taking in the sights, Frank realizes he's in the middle of a zombie outbreak. They're relatively safe since the zombies have been barricaded out, but while he's looking for things to help strengthen the barricade, he notices an angry old man at the other side of the mall gate. When trying to snap a picture, the old man lashes out at him for summoning him to the mall, but shuffles off once he realizes that he's mistaken. At the same time, an old lady who had bumped into Frank when he first arrived spots her missing dog who had gotten locked out with the zombies. 
In a panic, she fucking demolishes the guys trying to stop her and breaks down the barricade, allowing the zombies to pour in. A man on the second floor urges everyone to get to safety, but for you, there's a massive horde in the way. This is where you really get a feel for what's going on and how you plan to navigate zombies since this is the first time you control Frank under threat of death. Frank's no super cop, just a guy with a camera, so you can pick literally anything up to bash the zombies away, but in the end, you can't save anyone but yourself. Frank escapes and takes refuge in the mall security room where he meets Department of Homeland Security Officer Brad, his partner Jesse, and Otis, the mall janitor, who seals the security office off from the rest of the mall as a last line of defense after realizing Frank is the only survivor to have made it inside. Brad and Jesse are initially reluctant to talk to Frank since they figure he's here just to get a story, but ultimately realize they'll have to work together. Armed with his camera, a map of the mall, and a walkie-talkie-like transceiver, Frank uses the air ducts to get back inside the mall. It's up to him to save anyone he can find and figure out the mysteries behind the zombie outbreak before his only escape route comes back for him. Dead Rising is a third-person action horror game with many quirks to keep the gameplay interesting. The mall is full of zombie fighting items and just about anything you can think of you can use, ranging from extremely useful to hilarious but not really effective. Machetes, benches, soccer balls, guns, which kind of control like ass, boxes, teddy bears, shopping carts, CDs are all at your disposal. However, these items can't be used infinitely and will break after use. Hell, if you really want to, you can even just throw hands. Zombies too close? Punch them in the face. Flash kick them. A horde of zombies blocking your path? get on top of them and constipatedly walk across. And this mall is huge, almost open world, so getting from place to place is a trek. But you can grab a skateboard or shopping cart and sometimes even a car and just book it, maybe even knock some zombies out along the way. But these, like every other item you come across, will also break after you, so you might accidentally find yourself in the middle of some hungry zombies. Frank, obviously, isn't invincible, so in order to replenish his health, you can find food and drinks around the mall, from frozen pizzas, raw vegetables and yogurt, to chips, uncooked steak, wine, and pies, but some foods do expire and will make Frank sick. Just like real life. The downside to having just about everything at your disposal is not only do your items break after use, but you can only carry but so much shit at one time. You have limited inventory space, and sometimes you have to choose between having a cool third machete or having some orange juice to heal your wounds. As expected, Frank starts off pretty weak and moves like he's got the craziest wedgie in existence. But as you play the game, you'll level Frank up to be a powerhouse with new hand-to-hand -hand combat moves, more health, and even more inventory space, but he'll still walk like he's a long step away from shitting himself. Leveling up in this game consists of roughly four categories. Enemy killing, escort missions, photography, and miscellaneous shit. All actions in these categories give you a certain number of prestige points, known as which serves as this game's experience points, and as you level up, you'll get stat increases like more health or new combat moves that, in the grand scheme of things, aren't very helpful and can be very situational, but still kind of fun. While you run around the mall, you'll be thrust into an unfolding story at a moment's notice. These story missions, referred to as cases, further the plot along, but requires you to be at a specific place at a specific time. Because the story is predicated on you being somewhere to catch the action, it's very possible to miss a story beat, meaning the truth of what's going on with the zombie outbreak is now lost to Frank, and he will leave Willamette with more questions than answers. The game does allow you to keep playing and just noodle around until your helicopter ride comes through, but to complete the story, you'd have to play through again and be on time. And with a mall as big as it is, trying to figure out where and when to be somewhere is a pain. So Frank has a cool handy watch to check the time, but it also acts as your compass to track where you're supposed to be going. This crazy taxi arrow points you in the direction of your destination, but it isn't always the quickest way. Hey, hey, come on over, have some fun with Crazy Taxi! You'll also have optional missions known as scoops, which Otis will alert you to via the transceiver. These will point you to survivors in need. Frank, however, is locked out of most actions other than moving while listening, so God help you if he gets interrupted because he will complain you cut him off and then start the conversation from the fucking beginning. Welcome to your own personal hell. Between that and escorting these people from wherever the fuck you found them back to the security room, you will have your hands full. Some can follow behind you on their own, and some need to be carried, and some, mostly women, need to have their hand held. Frank can also command survivors to follow him or go to a specific place that he marks, but the AI for the survivors are completely fucking stupid, and will sometimes either ignore your command or just walk into a horde of zombies that could have been easily avoided. 
All survivors have a health bar to keep track of, and survivors that can walk on their own can be given weapons to help fight back the zombies, but sometimes that means they'll be more inclined to try and fight zombies instead of following you, so they'll wind up accidentally bashing any of the other survivors trailing behind, or getting murdered in the process. Because they have a health bar, you can give them food to replenish their health, but just like you, they aren't invincible, and with their AI being kind of dumb, they can die, or if you've hit them too many times trying to keep zombies away from them, they can turn hostile towards you, meaning you won't be able to save them anymore. The best escorts are anyone that needs help getting around, since you don't have to worry about their AI, and Frank essentially can't take damage while holding on to them, so you can just wiggle through zombie crowds with relative ease. But you have to be careful traversing the mall, as if you try to enter a new part of the mall and they're too far away from you, you'll leave them behind, leaving them susceptible to zombie attacks. Now of course, it's totally up to you if you actually want to save these people or not, because you can totally ignore them or kill them yourself, but they will grant you a big boost if you take them to safety. While most of the people you come across are just trying to survive, some people have had a full mental breakdown and are a genuine threat to you or the people they've crossed paths with. These are psychopaths, mini bosses of sorts that are regular people pushed to insanity by the zombie outbreak or are just genuinely bad people taking advantage of the chaos. Guys like this dad making his kids shoot regular people, or this chainsaw clown, or this fucking guy. But this does put an interesting twist on the people in the mall, not just being static enemies, but real threats with motives and for some tragedy behind their actions. Some you can even turn the life around and save them, though most of them just have to be murdered. Though there are some you can kind of ignore or miss altogether. And since Frank is a photojournalist, you can whip out your camera and snap a quick pic to document the world around you from just zombies to touching reunions to psychopaths doing psychopath things. The composition of your shots matter and will reward you with There are even special photo op shots you can take, which is indicated by the sign for maximum the pictures you take, based on what's going on, can fall into one of five categories. Drama for dramatic reunions or desperate situations, outtake for goofy fun, brutal for brutality, horror for zombies, and <laughs> erotica for burriness. Things will progress as the days go by, with the zombies getting stronger and more aggressive at night, and the game will throw new things at you mission after mission to keep things fresh. Zombie Queen Parasites are now a weapon to utilize against large hordes, where just killing one after collecting it will kill anyone in close proximity, which you can find in zombies that look like they're having a silent disco party. Then a cult will take over the movie theater and most sections of the mall, giving you a new threat where if you're not careful, they'll spit pocket sand on you, strip you naked, and put you in a box. And then the military will show up, shoot the shit out of you, strip you naked, and put you in a helicopter. But it's all good, cause you know Frank? I've covered wars, you know. So the story goes, Frank finds himself entangled in a government cover-up. Dr. Barnaby, oh yeah, um, this is Dr. Barnaby, was head of a research facility in a Central American town called Santa Cabeza, where they were conducting experiments to mass-produce livestock to produce more meat for the U.S. population. But as all experiments go, they discovered a wasp-like creature known as a queen that would turn the livestock into zombies with a single sting. This led to a queen escaping the facility and infecting the town, which would lead the government to send special forces to come in and wipe everyone out, and then cover it up as a drug raid. It's this massacre of innocent lives in his hometown that led Carlito, um, uh, fuck, this is Carlito, to take queens and release them in Willamette. His plan, as a last resort, with slight reluctance from his sister Isabella, is to blow up the mall, sending zombie parasites into the atmosphere to cause a national zombie outbreak. Frank, with Isabella's help, is able to stop Carlito's plan, but soon finds that DHS has decided to do a full cleanup of the mall to cover up the outbreak, killing anyone they find. Oh yeah, um, also Brad and Jesse become zombies and there isn't anything you can do about it, so sorry. Frank rushes to the helipad at the end of his three-day deadline to be rescued, but his ride meets a grisly fate at the hands of the trademark Capcom sleeper zombie. Defeated, Frank falls to his knees and does nothing as zombies approach, with the screen fading to black. This is where the story seemingly ends, and you are able to get one of six endings, but if you made it through all cases and got ending A, you begin the second act, known as Overtime Mode. In this mode, there are no cases or scoops to follow, just one cohesive narrative. Isabella comes to save Frank before he gets bit, but he passes out just as she arrives. Frank wakes up in Carlito's hideout where Isabella tells him he's been infected somehow and that he has a high tolerance, meaning it'll take him a little longer to become a zombie. 
I actually love this bit only because Frank's reaction here is actually pretty great because it's exactly how you would expect a regular person to act with disbelief. So, uh... <laughs> so what you're saying is that I get to spend longer waiting for the inevitable. Is that it? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure lucky is the word I'd use. <sighs> Isabella is able to synthesize a temporary cure for him with some things Frank finds throughout the mall. And there is a small side plot about Carlito having a backup plan of infecting 50 kids with the zombie parasites and giving them Isabella's temporary cure, but it doesn't go anywhere until Dead Rising 3, and that's a whole can of worms on its own. So let's pretend that it didn't happen. Anyway, Frank stumbles across a tunnel under the courtyard clock tower with zombies pouring out of it. After realizing they can potentially escape through it, Isabella and Frank venture into the tunnel with the zombie repellent Isabella made. Once through the tunnel, they spot a military jeep they can take to drive out, but just as they get somewhere, a huge tank comes and blocks their path. After an unfun rail shooter segment, the tank flips their jeep, and its head commander, Brock, exposits to Frank that he was the leading officer of the Santa Cabeza cleanup operation, and now again for the Willamette outbreak. Suddenly, the tank turns Brock to show him a horde of approaching zombies, and while his back is turned, Frank runs up and Superman punches the fuck out of him. As his last obstacle to freedom, Brock and Frank face off. No weapons, just fists. This fight isn't hard, just a bit cheesy and annoying, as with all fist fights on a tank, your opponent can do whatever the fuck they want, but so can you. You can spit on them a bunch, or just let the zombies trap him in a never-ending cycle of falling, so you can just kick him straight in the head as he attempts to get up. In the end, Brock falls and lands in the waiting arms of the zombies. With the scene looking as futile as it is, surrounded by zombies with no way out, Frank lets out an anguished roar, and the scene fades to black before the credits roll. You never get to see how they escape, but the game offers a text display that tells you Frank and Isabella managed to escape, with Frank giving all the info he has to expose the government. But since the government does what it does, they acknowledge partial responsibility for what happened with the livestock in Santa Cabeza and pretty much nothing else, denying anything with Willamette and blaming it all on terrorists, and as the world does, normalized to the terrors of the world, they forget all about Willamette pretty quickly. Honestly, it's a pretty strong commentary on news saturation and is still very pertinent even today where violence and crazy situations are just kind of normalized to the general populace through social media. All in all, this is a game that lets you do pretty much whatever you want. Hell, you can even change Frank's outfit whenever you want, leading to some hilarious juxtaposition on serious cutscenes. Like, look at this guy. We're having a serious convo and he's in here looking like this. Exactly what is this last resort talk all about? Carlito said that he'd blow up the mall if he were cornered. <laughs> it's great. Dead Rising's got that Capcom charm that we know and love, and the characters are multifaceted, kinda. But they have real motives that for some are kinda goofy, but for others are just hitting the sweet spot of sympathetic and believable. Frank is my favorite. Honestly, he gives you the feeling that he can't believe he's in the middle of some shit, but damn it, he's gonna make it work. You even have the potential to try your hand at Infinity Mode, a full survival sandbox mode where Frank has to survive off the food in the mall and fend off survivors and psychopaths for as long as he can, with a constantly depleting health bar. The mode even has a notoriously hard achievement available for surviving 7 days, which is 14 consecutive hours in real life time. Dead Rising is a gem with gameplay elements that need a bit of refining, like only being able to save at bathroom stalls, the stupid survivor AI, getting stun locked on everything, and this fucking transceiver, and lord knows these faces could use some work. But hopefully we'll see some quality of life updates in the remaster coming out next week. The franchise as a whole had four mainline titles, a few additional what-if scenarios, and some re-releases, with Dead Risings 3 and 4 being a hot mess of a dumpster fire, leaving the franchise DOA for the last seven years. With the remake next week, here's hoping to return to form for the series. Hey, thanks for watching. If you've never seen or heard of Dead Rising, I hope this video shed some light and got you interested to check out the series. This game really is something special and has a lot to offer, so I hope you've been inspired to play the game for yourself, whether that's the original or the new remaster, or you just watch the cutscenes online. Anyway, thanks again for watching. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. My name's Aurora Kays, and I'll see you next time.